on just a few things here at the top and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, first, let me start by echoing what you heard yesterday from the President regarding the U.S.-Japan alliance. Quote, over the last three years, the partnership between Japan and the United States has been transformed into a truly global partnership. The relationship with Japan is powerful proof that in investing in our alliance and raising our collective ambitions, we yield remarkable results, end quote. Our defense and security ties with Japan form the core of our alliance and are the cornerstone of regional peace and security in the Indo-Pacific. Recognizing that the alliance has reached new heights, we plan to further bolster our defense and security cooperation to allow for greater coordination and integration. I would add that yesterday you heard news on dozens of deliver deliverables for the alliance. I don't have any more specifics to provide today in terms of timelines and outputs, but we are working hard across all levels of the department to deliver on the agreements made by our national leaders and, of course, doing so in very close concert with our Japanese allies. Secretary Austin participated in the events with the Japan State visit yesterday and returned to the White House today to participate in the U.S.-Japan-Philippines Trilateral Leaders Summit. The United States, Japan, and the Philippines are three closely aligned maritime democracies with increasingly convergent strategic objectives and interests. And just this past week, in fact, our three countries and Australia held joint naval drills in the South China Sea. Separately, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Dr. Eli Ratner and his team are hosting our Korean allies today here at the Pentagon for the 24th U.S.-Korea Integrated Defense Dialogue. The dialogue involves a wide range of comprehensive discussions about how the United States and the Republic of Korea are modernizing and strengthening our alliance. We'll have much more information to provide this evening when the meeting concludes. And staying with the Philippines, uh, tomorrow we look forward to welcoming His Excellency Ferdinand Marcos Jr., President of the Philippines and Secretary of National Defense Gilbert Tedoro here at the Pentagon. Secretary Austin will host President Marcos and his delegation to discuss regional security issues to include our shared concerns on PRC coercive actions in the South China Sea. And in recent news, we were very sad to learn about the loss of two Philippines Navy pilots in a tragic accident. Our thoughts are with their families and their Navy, and we're ready to assist if needed. In light of the engagements I've outlined and as we continue to advance a shared vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific region, it's been a tremendous week of progress with our allies. And finally, Secretary Austin spoke with his Israeli counterpart this afternoon, Minister Gallant, to discuss the current situation in the Middle East and to reaffirm the U.S. ironclad commitment to Israel's security against threats from Iran and its proxies. We'll have a full readout of the call avail available later today. And with that, I'll be glad to take your questions. Start with Associated Press, Lita Baldor. Thanks, Pat. Um, can you bring us up to date a little bit on the JLOTs? The Secretary said earlier this week that he expected it could begin initial operations the third week of the month, which by my calculation would be next week. So have they even started to build anything yet? Can you just tell us where that stands? Sure. Um, as you know, we announced on 8 March uh, that we estimated that JLOTS would be in place and operational in approximately 60 days. That continues to be the case. Uh, we estimate that JLOTS will be operational in late April, early May time frame, which of course is within that 60-day window. Um, we're obviously working as fast as we can on that effort, recognizing that any operation can be affected by uh, multiple variables, but our forces supporting this effort uh, continue to stay focused on the mission and the important task that they've been given. So again, we'll continue to provide updates. Uh, but to answer your question, no, there's been no construction in the water at this stage. Very uh, wrong when he said. Uh, week of the month. Again, we're working towards having it operational toward the end of the month and early May. But not what he said. We're not to the third week of April yet. We'll keep you posted. Okay. Warren. Just a quick follow on, on J Lots. When it becomes operational, should it be able to move the maximum number of, of truckloads or, or loads of goods immediately, or is there some ramp up process, some sort of testing process that needs to happen that will further delay its ability to really have an impact? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I understand it, uh, essentially, you know, you'll, you'll see sort of a phased approach in terms of initial operations capability uh, and the ability to, to receive um, humanitarian assistance. Uh, but of course, you know, based on 
various conditions that commander set to achieve full operations capability, you'll see that, that capability ramp up. Uh, again, as we get closer to the initial operations capability uh, and having the peer go operational, we'll, we'll certainly provide much more detail. Thank you. Body. Thank you, General. Um, so I want to go back to the to the call today between uh, Secretary Austin and Mr. Uh, Gallant. Um, today, uh, USAID Administrator uh, Samantha Power uh, confirmed uh, assessment by the IPC that there's famine in uh, in North uh, Gaza. The Israeli uh, government made a commitment to open uh, crossing in the northern part of Gaza for the flow of aid. Um, did the Secretary get a, a, a clear commitment or a date from Mr. Gallant on when this step uh, will happen, and how satisfied is he with the uh, government of uh, Israeli government basically implementing what they promised to do? Yeah, well, as it relates to today's phone call, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll have a full readout on that, so I'll, I'll wait for that to come out. Um, but in general, uh, and you know, to include the, the most recent call uh, he had last week, um, the Secretary does continue to talk with Minister Gallant uh, about the importance of ensuring humanitarian assistance can get into Gaza. Uh, and so I think uh, some of this, the initial steps that we've seen in terms of uh, ramping up the number of trucks that can come into Gaza uh, is a good step, but I think we want to see much more. Uh, and I think we'll continue to have those conversations, not only within the Department of Defense, but I know that's also happening uh, elsewhere throughout the U.S. government. Uh, to see those concrete steps about Israel's commitment to get additional humanitarian assistance into Gaza. On a separate topic, but at, at the issue of Iranian threat, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, we've seen reports yesterday, specifically yesterday, that well, Iranian attack on Israel is imminent. That's in response to Israel targeting of the Iranian consulate in, in Syria. Um, how concerned uh, are you that the Iranians might follow through with their threats? And are you seeing any indications that this is what they intend to do? Yeah, well, we're certainly monitoring the situation closely. I, I don't have a crystal ball, and I'm, I'm not going to get into specific intelligence. I would just say that what you heard the president say, uh, and as I highlighted in my topper, uh, we are in close contact with the Israelis uh, to include today's phone call with Minister Gaunt. Uh, and that U.S. commitment to Israel's security against threat from uh, threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. And I'll just leave it there. Let me go to Idris. Um, yesterday, the State Department put out a statement saying that Secretary Blinken had spoken with Defense Minister Gallant. Given that he's Austin's counter Secretary Austin's counterpart, was the Secretary on the call? He was not, but it's also not unusual that uh, Minister Gallant and Secretary Blinken speak. So as you know, when uh, Secretary Blinken travels to uh, Israel, he's had uh, – you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings as well. Does Secretary Austin talk to any other foreign ministers? Uh, on occasion, depending on where we're traveling. And, 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 and as I mentioned, tomorrow, for example, uh, you've got President Marcos, uh, who's the president of the Philippines, coming. So uh, a lot of it just depends on the specific topic. If it's foreign policy or, or uh, you know, s diplomatic issues uh, versus security assistance issues. So uh, the, the bottom line is, you know, when it comes to our relationship with Israel, um, th there are not necessarily uh, going to be, I'm not allowed to talk to that person, you're not allowed to, you know, it's, it's going to be full, robust communication. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when they've spoken most recently, or last week, um, they talked about the war in Central, Central Kitchen and the strike that killed the aid workers. Now you've had time to look over their investigation, their initial report. Are you satisfied with it? Um, is that something you endorse, their initial findings? Yeah, thanks, Idris. So, um, you know, you probably heard uh, the National Security Advisor, Mr. Sullivan, talk to that earlier this week. Um, as I understand it, that continues to be under review. So um, I don't have anything to provide to you from the Department of Defense standpoint at this point, other than, again, uh, Secretary Austin made very clear in his phone call with Minister Gallant uh, that we expect to see, uh, you know, concrete actions to, to be taken to prevent another strike like that from happening in the future. Tom. Thanks, General. Was, was uh, General Carrillo in um, Israel today? Is General Carrillo in Israel? Uh, yes, General Carrillo is in Israel. Uh, he's, as I understand it, traveling throughout the, the region. So um, certainly would refer you to CENTCOM for some more info on that. If, um, if Iran is to strike a target inside Israel, and would the, um, you know, we've talked a lot about, you've talked a lot about the ironclad, uh, you know, commitment to Israel. 
Would the um, Pentagon be obliged to, uh, to join in to respond? Yeah, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Um, you know, again, I've highlighted our ironclad commitment to uh, Israel's security. And then on a different topic, um, Monday's the anniversary of the start of the Sudan Civil War. Um, do you have any observations on that conflict? And um, do you have any op op <coughs> excuse me, assessments of, of Iran's role in it? Uh, I really don't. Uh, again, I will take that question for you because I, I know you had a question on that. Let me go to Anne and I'll come down here. So on JLATs, there are a lot of uh, aid trucks being allowed into Gaza. Is there any point where JLATs would not be deployed because you feel like the ground routes are sufficient? And then I just want to try again. If there is an attack on Israel from Iran, can we expect a U.S. military response? Uh, again, not going to get into hypotheticals, Anne. Um, I've underscored our commitment to Israel's security. Um, in terms of uh, would JLOTs still be needed if there's increased aid on the ground? Uh, at this point, uh, we have a, a mission, we have a task that we've been assigned, which is to uh, implement JLOTs to help increase the flow of humanitarian assistance into uh, Gaza. And so we're going to continue to stay focused on executing that mission. Uh, and we'll keep you updated if there's anything no changes. Point, there's no point at which you have to commit to actually building it. It's, as far as you know, it's, it's a clear timeline. You're, you're just moving ahead. Yeah, I mean, we obviously, as I mentioned, we have a timeline that we've set, uh, as in any operation, particularly one that's going to be conducted in a combat zone. There are variable, variables which could affect that timeline. Um, but as of, as of right now, as I mentioned to Lita, uh, we are on course uh, to go operational at the end of the month, uh, early May. So I'll keep you posted. Eunice. Thank you, General. It, you said that you're not going to speculate on anything when it comes to the U.S. response to poss possible Iranian attacks inside uh, Israel. Uh, one U.S. senator suggested today <coughs> that there be uh, joint U.S.-Israeli strikes against Iran <coughs> if there were such uh, attacks against Israel. Are you ruling out anything at this point? I know you're not speculating, but is, is, is a U joint U.S.-Israeli strike ruled out in this department? Um, you know, look, the, from the very beginning of this conflict, uh, the Department of Defense established two key objectives, you know, among the among four, which, which I've discussed before. But two of those objectives have been to protect our forces and our citizens in the region, as well as support Israel's inherent right to self-defense. And so that hasn't changed. Uh, and so as we monitor potential threats and as we, you know, do, we'll continue to take appropriate steps. Uh, to include any necessary force protection measures if our forces are threatened. Um, but when it comes to, you know, speculating on when and if uh, Iran may attack uh, Israel, uh, again, I'm just not going to get into speculating or, or discuss intelligence. Um, and, and again, I'll just underscore what I said, that our commitment to Israel's security is, is ironclad. One quick follow-up, if I may. If Iran attacked Israel, would that be considered an escalation or retaliation by the DOD? Yeah, again, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Uh, let me go to the phones here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you. The Navy released a picture today, uh, this week showing an O5 firing weapon with the squad common optic backwards. Is DOD considering ordering sailors to go through any kind of training on the fundamentals of firearms and small arms in the wake of this. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'd have to re refer you to the Navy for any questions uh, regarding uh, training. Thank you. Let me go to uh, Jared, I'll monitor. Hey, Pat, my question has been asked, but I might try it a different way, I guess. Um, uh, following the Secretary's call for, with, uh, with Defense Minister Gallant, um, uh, you know, the U.S. is committed to Israel's security. Uh, part of that is reestablishing deterrence. Uh, if that need be done. Um, but how confident is the secretary that Israel is also committed to the security of U.S. forces in the region and the sensitivities uh, around that? Yeah, the, the secretary is very confident of Israel's commitment to the security of U.S. forces. I mean, as you know, Jared, we have a long-standing uh, security cooperation relationship with Israel um, to to address, you know, multiple um, threats throughout the region with the primary aim uh, being regional security and stability. And so um, I'll just leave it there. All right. Let me, I, let me get a couple of other folks here. Tony. 
I'm just going to go to Ukraine for a second here. General Cavelli in the last couple of days has painted a very uh, bleak picture of uh, Ukraine's chances for success if the supplemental doesn't pass. <clears throat> I want to go back to the arcane issue of a plan B, the $4 billion that the Pentagon has an authority to uh, tap into re uh, reservoir uh, reserves, but you don't have the money to replenish yet. Is there any talk now of just taking that risk and starting to use that $4 billion on the assumption at some point you will get replenishment dollars since it's looking dire for Ukraine and that the House is not moving on its supplemental? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Well, I, I certainly don't have anything to announce in, in terms of uh, taking an approach like that. I, I think, you know, we've been pretty clear as recently as this week when the Secretary was testifying on the Hill to the SASC uh, about how critical it is uh, that the supplemental be passed so that we can ensure Ukraine has the volume of security assistance support that it needs in order to uh, continue their fight for freedom against Russia. Push back. I mean, your $800 billion organization department here, is there any discussion, though, in terms of we, I think we need to push for this $4 billion? Any signals at all, any meetings discussing that kind of a plan B? Uh, again, right now, the, the primary emphasis is on working with Congress to get the supplemental passed. Uh, that is the, the most urgent need. That is the uh, most um, uh, realistic way to ensure that Ukraine has the support that they need uh, and for the fight that they're in. So, you know, we're always going to continue to consult closely with Congress and our allies and our partners uh, because, again, it's important to remember that it's not just the United States that's supporting Ukraine. This is an international effort. Uh, we are committed to working with and supporting Ukraine uh, in their defense. But as of right now, um, again, we're going to continue to stay focused on getting the supplemental passed. I think a want call out when you do that uh, detailed readout. Can you discuss whether the F-15 sale that's hung up on the hill right now was an, a, a topic of discussion that the Minister Gallant pushed for that, or you know, if there was any discussion on the need for those planes? Um, well, take a look at the readout, and then you know we can follow up from there. Okay, thank thank you. you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. I uh, have a couple on Ukraine. We heard Dr. Wallander saying in Congress yesterday that. The U.S. was concerned uh, about Ukraine attacking Russian oil refineries because those were civilian targets. Secretary Austin also said that Ukraine is better served in going after tactical and operational targets on the battlefield. At the same time, NATO officials say that these strikes significantly undermine Russia's economy and its ability to fund the war. So I have two questions here. What is your assessment of the impact these strikes have on the dynamics of Russia's war against Ukraine? And secondly, why does the Pentagon not consider oil refineries that are directly linked to Russia's ability to fund the war as legitimate strategic targets for Ukraine? Yeah, well, I, I won't speak for uh, Dr. Wallander and, and, you know, obviously the, the secretary's words speak for themselves. Um, as Secretary Austin highlighted, you know, our focus is on supporting Ukraine and its ability to defend its sovereign territory. Uh, and so when it comes to the situation at hand uh, on the battlefield, um, you know, we, we continue to think uh, and support Ukraine's efforts to take back sovereign territory and defend uh, territory from further Russian aggression. Um, I'll just leave it there. Do you have any assessment of the impact these strikes have on the situation of the war? I, I don't. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Are you taking precautions against any attacks by Iran or process? I mean, do you expect attacks on your assets in, in the region? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, again, you know, as we always do uh, and as we've been doing since uh, Hamas's attack on October 7th, we are going to continue to take appropriate steps to ensure the safety of our forces uh, in the region. Um, for op operation security and force protection reasons, I won't go into those specifics other than to say, you know, the safety and security of our forces is always paramount. Uh, and lastly, sir, uh, is the visit of CENTCOM commander as a part of your coordination with Tel Aviv in case Israel is attacked? Is it, I'm sorry, can you say that again? I mean, the visit of uh, CENTCOM commander to Israel is a part of the coordination with Tel Aviv is if Israel is attacked. Um, as I understand it, uh, you know, due to recent developments, he moved up his trip to meet with key IDF leadership, uh, discuss the current security threats in the region. Um, but beyond that, I'd refer you to CENTCOM. Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you, sir. I wanted to ask about the AUKUS trilateral program and a little bit about the progress. Ms. Singh reported earlier this week that the Advanced uh, Capabilities Industry Forum would be launched later this month. Can you speak a little bit more about that and kind of uh, what's involved with launching that type of forum and what the Secretary hopes to see from that part of the AUKUS effort? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, you, you know, I'm going to be infinitely disappointing here uh, and just say that we'll have much more to provide on that in the near future. Uh, so just stay tuned and, and we'll get you more. Let me go to Oren, then I'll go back to the phone here. Uh, actually, my question was just asked. I was going to ask whether uh, General Kirill's trip was <coughs> rescheduled or a response to the Israeli attack. In the yeah, again, my understanding was he had a, a scheduled trip uh, to the to Israel, um, again, due to recent events, moved it up. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me go to uh, Lars Seligman, Politico. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, Given the Iranian threat to Israel, do, does the U.S. assess that there is any threat to U.S. forces in the region? And have you taken any specific measures uh, to ramp up force protection? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, from the very beginning of this conflict, uh, two of our, of our uh, key objectives have been to ensure the safety and security of U.S. forces and citizens in the region, uh, as well as supporting Israel's inherent right to self-defense. And so uh, as we monitor potential threats, uh, we're of course taking appropriate measures uh, to, uh, to include any necessary force protection measures, but I won't go into those for OPSEC and, and force protection reasons. Uh, let me go to uh, Tara, AP. Can I have, uh, if I could ask that, but secondly, um, since the World Central Kitchen strike uh, there was a, the investigation that came out from the IDF. Is the U.S. is the Pentagon satisfied with changes the IDF has made to its rules of engagement without talking about specific rules of engagement? But are you satisfied with the changes the IDF has made uh, in terms of uh, to the safety of aid workers? Uh, you know, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Laura, um, you know, the the investigation that uh, that Israel is doing uh, and that the information that they've provided to us is, is still under review. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, more to follow uh, as, as the White House and NSC take the lead on that. Um, Secretary Austin, in his uh, phone call last week with Minister Gallant, did have the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, efforts that Israel is taking. Uh, of course, um, you know, we're going to with, withhold judgment until uh, we learn more, but we do expect them to take concrete steps to ensure that that kind of strike does not happen again. Come back in the room. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is that how important is these two big visits to Washington, Japanese Prime Minister and Philippines President, as far as China's threat is uh, growing in the region, uh, uh, including Chinese president said that uh, his goal is to take over uh, Taiwan, or one day, someday, he will, uh, they will attack Taiwan. Well, my question is that as far as U.S. national security concern, so where do we stand, how U.S. will act or react as far as these activities in the region by Chinese threats? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you, know, thank you. As I highlighted at the top, um, these visits this week uh, are very important uh, because, again, they demonstrate the, the strengthening of our alliances uh, with two very important allies, Japan uh, and the Philippines. And, and when it comes to uh, the situation in the Indo-Pacific, it's important, again, to underscore that our focus is on a free and open, secure and stable and prosperous Indo-Pacific and working with like-minded partners to ensure uh, that it stays that way, uh, and that uh, the sovereignty of countries is respected, and that the uh, international uh, uh, rules-based order uh, is taken into account. Uh, and so that's really our focus, is on, on working together to ensure regional security and stability. Uh, and if there are countries out there uh, that have a different view, that use coercion and aggression, uh, we certainly want to work together to deter and prevent uh, those kinds of activities from impeding or uh, on individual nation sovereignty. Sorry, just uh, to include, where would you fit India in these situations in the region? Because India mm -hmm. is also concerned as far as Chinese activity in the uh, uh, Indian Ocean is concerned. Of course. I mean, as we've talked about before, uh, India uh, is, is a very important partner of the United States, and uh, the relationship between the U.S. and India continues to grow. 
uh, and we look very forward uh, to continuing to work with India uh, towards our shared values in the region of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thanks, sir. I skipped over Tara here real quick. Tara, did you have a question or are you good to go? I did. Thank you for remembering me. Um, I wanted to talk to uh, Haiti. What is uh, the Pentagon assessing right now with the ground situation in Haiti? And is there any movement of sending additional forces there for any sort of protection? Yeah, thanks, Tara. Um, no announcements to make right now regarding any additional forces, U.S. military forces to Haiti. Um, you know, again, we, we are, as we've previously announced, maintaining a, a small contingent for embassy security uh, at the moment. Um, you know, and again, in terms of the situation on the ground there, uh, you, you know, you're reading the news just like I am in terms of uh, the, the impact uh, that gangs are having uh, and the, the high levels of crime. And of course, remains a, a very serious situation in Haiti, uh, something that our uh, State Department, I know, is following very closely, as are we. Uh, but I have uh, no further announcements at this point. So since the beginning of the war in Gaza, the, the department and the secretary were very clear that they don't want to see this conflict spread, and, and actions were taken to make sure that doesn't happen. How do you assess the, uh, the impact of the strike uh, in Damascus on, uh, general, on the security uh, in the region? And do you see any risks in this instance by supporting and defending Israel that the U.S. might be sending the wrong message that diplomatic installations are a le legitimate target? Yeah, so um, in, in terms of the, the strike in Damascus, I'll let Israel speak uh, for themselves. Um, you know, and when it comes to preventing a wider regional conflict, um, you know, so far there is not. Uh, we certainly hope that doesn't happen. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, since the very beginning of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, we have been working very hard to prevent a wider regional conflict from happening, uh, and those efforts continue. Thank you. Yeah, I have a follow-up to what Tony asks. Last night, we know that Russia destroyed one of the biggest power plants near Kiev, and Ukraine said that it was possible partially because they are running out of critical air defense munitions. So is there anything that the U.S. can possibly do to, alone or maybe together with the help of the allies to get Ukraine what it needs now, air defense munitions, as we are waiting for the Congress to act. Yeah, and we've been doing it. Um, you know, certainly the, the most important thing we could do is get the supplemental passed. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that the department and the U.S. government is, is you know, not doing anything. Um, as you know, we continue to consult closely with our international allies and partners uh, and, and with Ukraine on the importance of providing uh, very important capabilities to include air defense to Ukraine. So we'll continue to consult with uh, our coalition around the world to ensure and see what we can get for Ukraine on that front. But again, the most important thing we can do right now from a U.S. national security standpoint is pass the supplemental. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.